Welcome to the Golden Apple Show. This is your host, Jacqueline Jerry. Uh, today we are talking about alcoholism. We have a lot of stigma, we have a lot of stereotypes, we have a lot of uh, narratives that are not supportive in terms of alcoholism. Basically, talking about addictions, we are so judgmental, we'll say things like, uh, it's their choice, they made a conscious decision, they knew what they were doing and they got into it. But you know, sometimes it's not about making a choice, sometimes it's just circumstances of life that push you. I've interacted with a number of uh, recovering alcoholics, and what they tell me is when they indulged for the first time, they felt, you know, a good high, they got a bit of confidence, you know, they felt like uh, they had a clique of friends, uh, they felt, you know, like their life was well put together, they were able to forget their worries, they were able to forget their stresses, they were able to sleep better at night, some of them even said that they had better sex after, you know, indulging in alcohol. But um, at the end of the day, it is damaging. It is really damaging. And we need to emphasize on the fact that you do not have to get a high to live a productive life. You do not have to use alcohol, drugs, or anything to just make you escape from reality. Because at the end of the day, it's going to catch up with you. I read a book by my guest here. It's called Still I Rise. And she'll tell us about it. And her story is very interesting because she pointed out, you know, how she uh, started using alcohol from a very early age. A very early age. And so I will just invite her so that she can be able to take it up so I don't take too much of her time. Caro? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Karibu sana. Asante sana. Good to have you. Thank you for having me. Mm. Sasa, do we start with the, the book or we start with your story and then we just... The book comes later. Okay. I think um, I, we start from the top. Yes. Um, first, I am Caroline Kagia. Mm -hmm. I am a certified addictions therapist. Mm -hmm. I'm also a speaker. Mm -hmm. An author and mm -hmm. the founder of an initiative called Caroline Kagia Wellness Initiative, yeah. um, which I started as a result of my struggle with alcoholism that spanned two decades of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm also a mom to two, a 17 year old and a seven year old. Mm -hmm. I am also a recovery coach. Basically, I wear many hats mm -hmm. and I'm also in recovery. Okay. Yeah. I remember at the beginning I was struggling to say a recovering alcoholic yes. because I really had uh, an issue with that name. I, I find it judgmental. I don't know. You, it's, what do you it's, think about it's, it? It's not judgmental. I think it's because recovery is a lifetime. Alcoholism mm -hmm. is manageable. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's curable because like now if I sit down to have a drink, mm -hmm. I might sit here and you'll pick me maybe next week because I'll drink to drink to drink. So alcohol that's why we call ourselves recovering because it is every day a day at a time a step at a time mm -hmm. you will never say you're fully recovered from alcoholism until the day jesus calls you home that's the day you'll have settled that case mm -hmm. but from now until god knows when mm -hmm. um i'll forever be in recovery mm -hmm. you know um i can never go back to being a social drinker whatever that means because i was never a social drinker from the start mm. mine was full throttle right from day one mm -hmm. yeah well, I must commend you on your courage to talk about this because, again, this is a topic that is still a taboo. Yeah. And you'll get people commenting and saying, you know, like women should not even indulge in alcohol. Yeah. And when they realize that a woman is, you know, who has been an addict of alcohol and mm. so many mean comments might come your way. Mm -hmm. So I commend you for having the courage to do this here Thank today. You. It's Thank very, you. very bold of you. Thank you. So you can just tell us how did this all start? Because there's a, there's a genesis to all this. Yeah, me and my drinking started... I wasn't really young. Mm -hmm. I was um, 19. Mm -hmm. I was in Form 5. Um, I had the privilege of doing my A-levels mm -hmm. after Form 4. I did my high school in Limuru Girls School. Mm -hmm. Then um, I had the privilege of doing 5 and 6, just somewhere in Nairobi. And uh, me had always been the good girl throughout my childhood. Church girl, firstborn, uh, high school, I joined the Christian Union, mm -hmm. the pianist. I played piano from the time I was 6 years. Mm -hmm. Grew up with a very strict mom, a, per a perfectionist of a mother, so everything had to be mm. in alignment with, you know, her desires for her children. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember in Form 2, I had made a vow to God that I'll never drink, I'll never smoke, I'll never have sex before I get married. You know those vows we make when we're in high school, Form 2, especially that time, eh? mm. And I was so set on that. Mm. So then I finished Form 4, then I get into Form 5, and growing up, I remember I had... A uh, very low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, I was quite frightful as a child. I think it's because of the way I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I used to keep a lot to myself. Then I get to Form 5 and I'm getting into culture shock because now I've mixed with people from different kinds of races. Eh? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing even girls smoking. And me, the only place I used to see girls smoking was on TV. 
Kuti Alode. And they were white. And now I'm seeing black girls at tea time, mm. it was called smoke break. Oh. And so me, I'm seeing people smoking cigarettes, and then there was also something else they used to smoke that I didn't know what it was. The smell was different, mm. which I came later to discover was something else mm. called marijuana. Mm -hmm. So there was this particular girl in my class who, she was inclined towards me, for lack of a better word. Mm. She really wanted to be my friend, and I didn't know why. Mm. Because she was everything I thought or I knew I was not. First, she was very popular. Mm. I knew I was not popular. She was very pretty. I thought I was not. She was very, she was liked by the boys. Me, I was, those ones who used to keep to myself. Kumbe, she was liked by the boys because she was really generous. With, oh. Yes. So, mm -hmm. that for me was a shocker. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, one day during her smoke break, mm -hmm. she, she asked me to try a cigarette and I tried it and I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So, I moved from what she was smoking and I tried menthol. And I stuck with menthol for about 19 years. And uh, very quickly she discovered Kara has never drunk alcohol, Kara has never had sex. Kara is pure. And she tells me how she, she started having sex when she was 15. And I'm like, 15? Me, 15, what was I doing? I think I was still in Form 1. Yeah. And, uh, but she knew there was a boy I, I, I told her I liked in another international school somewhere. Then she told me, you know what, Kara, if you get to sleep with this guy, I'll bring you a bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. And me and this boy had been platonic friends for about a year. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, now I'm thinking, I want to fit in with this girl and her, and her peers. Mm -hmm. And I want to get this bottle of wine. Because yeah. when we were growing up on Sundays, my dad used to take us out after church. Mm -hmm. And where he used to take us out in the restaurant, there was like a bar somewhere. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I would find myself walking through that bar mm -hmm. just to see. Not necessarily, I was not interested in what, just to see what was inside yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, you'll bring me a bottle of wine if I sleep with this guy. Mm -hmm. Then I used to remember those books I used to read in high school. You know, the Mills and Boone, oh, yeah. the Jackie Collins, <laughs> the Sidney Sheldon, and though they romanticize. Yeah, especially Sidney Sheldon. Sidney Sheldon. Yeah. She used to romanticize, you know, all, he used to romanticize rather mm -hmm. these books and whatever. So mm -hmm. I'm like, whatever is going to happen between me and this guy must be what is in the books. Sure. So what does Caro do? She tells this guy, and this guy is in shock. He's like, huh? But you oh, know, you're the one who, uh, I'm the initiated. one who initiated because I want this bottle of wine. Yeah, I know. You want to fit in Araka. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I called this guy and um, because he comes from a very influential family, he got his connections, got some nice place somewhere. We went and the deed was done. Suffice to say, it was nothing like they write in the books, but you know. Mm. So I go home and I'm like, good Lord. Now I started remembering the vows I'd made to God. Now I'm a smoker mm -hmm. because nicotine addiction comes in very quickly. Mm. So now I'm a smoker and now I've lost my virginity. But, well, see, Monday I'm going to get my bottle of wine. Ah, there's a reward. There's a reward. Yeah. Hmm. So Monday I go and report to this girl and I tell her, guess what, I did it. And she's so excited for me. You could think she's the one who was in that room with that guy. So she tells me, okay, tomorrow I'll bring for you your bottle of wine. And true to her word, she brought. It was 12% um, red wine, uh, 250 ml. And she tells me, because you're not drunk alcohol uh, at all, she told me you have your own bedroom. Mm -hmm. When you go home, after guys have gone to bed, open the window. Because mm -hmm. alcohol has a smell. Mm -hmm. Sit on your bed mm -hmm. and drink it slow, slowly. Me, I've been picked from school at four. I'm vibrating. I'm imagining if my mother was to open that bag, what would I say I'm doing with alcohol? Where did I get it from? Yeah. So, of course, I hid it well. I did my homework, did whatever I needed to do. So I waited for guys to go to bed and people have gone to bed. Mm -hmm. Hey, Carol now is alone in her bedroom. Mm -hmm. It's around midnight. Mm -hmm. I'm forgetting tomorrow is school. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even thinking, what if I actually get drunk tomorrow morning when I'm woken up to go to school? Mm -hmm. What happens yeah. next? Yeah. So I opened my window as I was told. And I take the first sip and I hated it. Mm. Then I took a gulp. I was like, yuck, mm. this thing tastes flat. Yeah. Then I'm not feeling anything. Then my brother, my immediate brother, the one who follows me, started drinking much earlier when he was about 16 and he used to drink hard liquor. Then I remember one time he had told me, Caro, when you start drinking, because I know one day you'll start drinking, mm -hmm. if you want alcohol to get to your head, mm -hmm. you take a gulp, swallow, and then you bend for the head rush. Oh, you get? Okay. So me, I did exactly that. So mm -hmm. I took a gulp, I stood up, did the head rush thing, nothing. So in hindsight, I finished 250 ml, 12% with nothing, no tipsiness, nothing. Mm. So I was so disappointed. I slept in the morning. I woke up fresh. Mm -hmm. 
took I went to school and I asked this girl, Kwani, what did you give me? Mm. She asked me, I told her, I didn't get high at all. Mm. And she tells me that you have a problem. Mm? You told me you have a problem. You didn't get high. Twelve mm. percent, you mm. didn't feel anything. I told her I didn't feel. Those words were to follow me for the next twenty years. So I didn't drink again. Um, the next time I drank was in Form 6 after we had finished. And now it is her, my new boyfriend, and myself from club in Westland. Mm -hmm. And so this guy buys me six cans of cider. And now I was, I was already a heavy smoker. I was doing up to a pack a day of menthol. Mm -hmm. So I did the first can, second, third, fourth. The sixth can is the one that took me out. Because I remember now blacking out and finding myself now in my friend's house mm. now my best friend mm. in their house where they used to live and i told god i'll never drink again mm -hmm. but never is a very strong word because what you negate has a way of coming back mm. to you mm -hmm. so in january the following year i was fortunate to leave the country i was going to do my degree in advertising multimedia and broadcasting mm -hmm. i was to do two years two years in malaysia then two years in australia my first and by then my parents were not well off eh? they had done a harambe what to, send you, to send me as the first one so that I can be there, the door opener for the rest because yeah. we are five. Yeah. So by the, by the third month of me being in Malaysia, I was already in trouble because now there's something in addiction we call tolerance, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. whereby if you are taking two beers now, now you need four to mm -hmm. feel the same high, yeah. like the initial two. Mm -hmm. So now beers are not working for me. So I moved to hard liquor. Mm -hmm. So now I was using the vodkas and the jeans. Now not am, only am I doing hard liquor, I'm also doing... Uh, 40 sticks of cigarettes per day and I'm smoking marijuana because I went to Eastern Asia and mm. in Eastern Asia um, marijuana is like you know whatever mm. but uh, me and uh, marijuana we broke vows so I stuck to cigarettes mm -hmm. and now I started skipping class and um, also my teachers called back home but every time my parents would call me they would hear I'm very sober so they did know where this was coming from mm. because they never sensed I was high or anything mm -hmm. Um, so you were able to camouflage? In... I was able to camouflage, mm -hmm. but somebody from Kenya who we had gone with her, uh, we had gone with her from here to Malaysia, mm -hmm. she called my parents and she said, Kara is in trouble. Mm -hmm. You guys need to do something. And this is after a series of car accidents. And every time we'd go out with her, she would find me blacked out in the toilet with someone trying to unzip me, but they were never able. So at the end of that year, instead of me staying for two years, I came back that year, at the end of that year. And my parents were so disappointed, you can imagine. So I did my, now I studied here. And those three years when I was in school, I did very well. Mm -hmm. But towards the end, the, the alcohol bug hit me again. Okay. And I started drinking heavily, but somehow I managed and I, I did very well in my studies. I did um, advertising mm -hmm. and marketing here. Now in the last year, I also conceived my son, who is now almost 17. And uh, at that point I'd become a Christian and all that, but I, now I, I backtracked and now here I am, pregnant and drinking. Nobody in my family knew I was pregnant because mm. I was very big. So my story is very long, uh, but because of time, I'll just, I just want to take you through the alcoholism process mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. I have always been very privileged to move from one job to another because mm -hmm. I was in sales and marketing for the longest. So I've even had the privilege of working outside mm -hmm. Kenya. So my salary kept increasing, but as my addiction grew, I realized that I would work in a place for a short time and get tired. So after I paid my salary after a short while, I would quit. No reason. Mm -hmm. I just quit. Two weeks later, I get a better job. So I kept going up the corporate ladder mm -hmm. until 2016. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I held a job and I quit after Easter. And at this point, I was in a very toxic relationship with uh, my daughter's father. Mm -hmm. And so now we broke off. We, we had to break it off because I kept landing in hospital. Uh, Ngong Police Station had my, my they're called what? OB, P3, those things. P3. Yeah, yeah, because of the damages <laughs> that have occurred. So we broke up. And my dad had started telling me in 2007 that I'm sick and I need rehab. That was in 2007. But you, you were in denial. I was not even in denial. Let me tell you the thing about alcoholism. Mm. Even those people who sleep in the gutters, mm. they never say they're alcoholic. They'll just say, oh, it was a bad day. Even the ones who pee on themselves on the way, yeah. say, oh, it was just, I was unable to hold. But I'm fine. Tomorrow I can hold. Mm -hmm. 
So in 2007, my son was very sick mm -hmm. and he was admitted in hospital. So my dad called me and it was a Friday, I was in a bar. He told me, I don't care where you are, come to Gertrude's. Your son is sick. So I go and I'm supposed to administer him medicine. But my hands are shaking so badly mm -hmm. that the medicine was just pouring around his mouth. And my dad was seated somewhere, he's just watching me. So he told me, okay, now in Kikuyu, you, you've been unable, you go back to wherever you came from, may mm -hmm. the Lord bless you. That time my son was living with my parents. Mm -hmm. Me was living on my own in Rungai. So my dad wrote me a very long letter and he told me that I'm sick and I need help. But who is Caro? That time I'm working for a media house in, so I'm in between Nairobi and Johannesburg every other time. So you know that pride that comes with, if I want to stop, I can stop. But every time I try to stop, the withdrawals, withdrawals is whereby your body reacts in a way where it's calling for mm -hmm. that thing, you're denying it. Mm -hmm. Every time I try to stop, the withdrawals would be bad. I would see things in my head, hallucinations. So mm -hmm. I'd have to have a drink to make things settle down. Mm -hmm. This is in 2007. So let me just ask, when you are trying to withdraw, is it you are trying to do it by yourself or you would sort help at some stage? What help? No? It is me. I can do this. I've been told I can't. I need to prove to them that I can. Mm -hmm. But every time mm -hmm. I try, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So this continued. So now the, the, the magnitude of it came in... Um, in 26, 2015, I remember when I broke off with my, my daughter's dad. My daughter was about six months. So we've broken up. I've quit my last job. My money is going down. So now I can no longer afford those high-end drinks. So now I'm drinking these cheap, cheap things for 120 bob, 150. That's how low I sank. Yeah. So now I have no money coming in. But me, I'm a salesperson. Even if I wanted to sell you in Jerry right now, I can sell you and you'll go. Right now, the way you're seated right there. Mm -hmm. I'll sell you and you'll go. So what did I start doing? The way men sell things in their houses. Yeah. Men started selling things. In the first house. thing to go was my fridge. That time we were living in a house. My dad is a developer, so he had given me and my kids a house. So the first thing to go was my fridge. Then my couches. Then my son's bike. Then my baby's bed. Name it. I sold Almost anything you can think of selling. A gas cooker was 60k. Now I was using like a small green stove for 300 bob, 400 bob. That's why you have to buy kerosene. Yes. You, you can imagine. Eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Mama Pimas knew my daughter by name. Because I would carry her in a carrier bag, mm -hmm. go to the Wines and Spirits. I tell them, Ata kama ni kwa credo, ni And they would give me. Because they knew this chick has to come every day to pick no less than four quarters per day. I would have to have one at my bedside in the morning, kuto a lock. Mm -hmm. you know so that i can continue with the flow of drinking my house girl has left nobody wants to hear from me i've become a person of sending please call me and when you call me back i'll make sure i have at least a thousand bob in my impressor because i'll tell you that my child has no food you know i'll give you a sob story and that's another thing about alcoholics alcoholics are very manipulative mm. there's a gift <laughs> and it's a bad gift an alcoholic can con you and you know you're being conned but somehow I'll still give you'll me. still give yeah. So with that 1,000 bob, I'll go to Mama Pima, I'll buy four quarters, mm -hmm. I'll buy cheap cigarettes. My daughter will take Witabix for 25 bob. Me, I'll buy two boiled eggs. You know, some funny, funny lifestyle. Mm -hmm. eh? Now, towards the end, I've sold almost everything, mm -hmm. apart from my TV and my phone. I'd gotten a buyer for my passport. Excuse Passports me? are sold. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I'd gotten a Nigerian who's going to buy it for 10k. That's how low I had sunk. But not yet. The Shylock who used to come to my house... One time he told me, Ay, Nanjeri, izi milango za nyumba zako ni poa. Kai. <laughs> izi milango za nyumba yako ni poa. Ni poa. I've sold almost everything. The reason I'll not sell my TV is because I need something to watch as I drink. Oh. And think about how good my life was. And in that space of time, all the people I used to catch on TV were people I've gone to school with, were either classmates, or we were somewhere together in college, and now they're high flyers. Oh, wow. And me now, I've become the laughing stock of where we used to live because everybody knows this guy in Kikuyu wa Monyota. That's a very bad word. That was my name. And they knew my folks. My folks are Christians, elders in the church. Mm. This girl was in choir. Look at her now. She's lost so much weight. She's wearing two pairs of jeans so that mm. she looks like she has. I've sold even my shoes. Then I remembered this Shylock. I sent him a please call me. He came. I told him, Izzy Milango's daughter. For those who don't understand Kiswahili, all these doors, open them up. My house was a three-bedroom, mm -hmm. own compound. He removed all the doors for all those three bedrooms. For 500 bob. Huh? 500 shillings. 
I was living in a house without doors. Doors, my friend. As in, if you want to come into my house, you just walk in. You get? That's how bad it was. And I remember that night I cried, but after I have alcohol in my system, mm, I was like, what the hell? Yeah. Like, ah, kukosawa, yeah. Mm. How many times did I end up ringing my neighbor's doors at night when I'm so drunk thinking I'm ringing my bell, but I'm ringing the neighbors? So one day my dad, I was in the kitchen, I don't even know what I was doing in the kitchen, but there was a, a lot of alcohol on the counter and my cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So my dad and my earphones were on. So apparently my dad rang the bell, I didn't hear. So what he did is he was able to open the gate and he walked in. Mm -hmm. So me, I'm turning, I'm just seeing my dad. Kwanyumba. Eh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to hide these things. He's telling me, mm -mm, don't even bother. The first thing he asked me, where is the baby? Mm. I don't even know where my daughter is. She's somewhere in the compound, but I don't know where she mm. is. By this time, they had already taken my son. Because I used to fight with my son physically. So he even used to defend himself by hiding a knife under his pillow. Because I hear he used to be so angry, there are times I would really hit him. So him to defend himself, he would keep a knife. Mm. So he's asking me, where is the baby? Me, I don't even know where the baby is. Then he asked me in Kikuyu, why are you auctioned? Because there is nothing in that house, mm. absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. No fridge, no seats, even my seven-seater mm. was gone. Mm. I used to sit on the floor. That's how ridiculous it was. The only thing I remember in that conversation was him telling me that, Jerry, you are named after my mom and mm. you know how much I love my mom. Mm. You're going to change, God is going to help you and all that. Mm. So I remember the, there are tears that while Levi's cry, mm. then they disappear in like a span of two seconds. Mm. So I cried, I looked for the baby. Went and borrowed a diaper from somewhere and moved on with life. And by the way, this whole time when I'd sunk to such a low level of drinking and depression was so bad, mm -hmm. I had covered all the mirrors in my house. I couldn't look at myself because I knew mm -hmm. I was ugly. I'd even started feeling ugly. I was feeling old. I never used to shower, never used to eat, mm -hmm. never wanted to interact with people. So the culmination of it came in uh, 2017, February. Mm -hmm. And I remember I sent my dad a piece for me and he called me back. By this time, he's the only one who was calling me. And mm. I told him I need to see you. He said, you know where we live? You come. Mm. He's not asking me whether I have fare or what. He told me, you come. Mm. Fortunately, our house and their house were five kilometers apart. So I walked five kilometers with the only shoe I had not sold. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I had not sold that shoe is because th there was no difference between the earth and the shoe. They looked alike. The mm. shoe was so beaten. Yeah. You see? Yeah. So I walked home and I told my dad, I need help. And so in February 2017, I, I got into rehab and I went in voluntarily. And I was in rehab for um, three months. I came out a day to my 37th birthday. Mm -hmm. And it is after that that I went into school and I studied addiction as a profession. And now I'm a certified therapist. Mm -hmm. and that is when I started my initiative. And by the grace of God, I've been able to share my story locally and internationally on all sorts of media. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm here today. Mm -hmm. Having this conversation and smiling because God changes people and yes. changes things. Yes, he does. Yeah. Jerry, I couldn't help but marvel at your story and wonder, oh my God, such a beautiful woman. I mean, you have gone through quite a lot. Yes. That's, that's a lot to handle. Um, and it's bold of you to even talk about it like it's a walk in the park. And I know the journey has not been easy for you. And I want to take you back a little bit because you say that uh, at the very beginning of your indulgence in alcohol, you, want, you wanted to fit in. It's, there was this girl who was popular and she was beautiful. She was everything you thought you were not. Yeah. And I heard you say that you had low self-esteem. So for you, saying yes to alcohol, saying yes to the booze was... It made you feel good. It made it uh, heightened your self-esteem. You felt like you belonged. It, yeah, it made me feel like I belonged, and um, I ended up becoming a people pleaser mm -hmm. because now when I started earning really well, I would Standard Street by on Standard Street mm -hmm. that time around Stanley Hotel there were some bars which were now converted into Somali restaurants. Mm -hmm. Those bars, I would call them on Thursday and tell them reserve three tables. Mm -hmm. We are coming on Friday with my friends. Oh. And I would bring people together, and I'm the one buying. And Kumbe, in hindsight, I was trying to cover up for that. It's like a lost identity. Yeah. As a child growing up with all this inferiority, now I'm feeling I'm in a space whereby, mm -hmm. please, recognize me. I can. And yet when I started suffering <laughs> properly from mm -hmm. addiction, 
none of them was there. Yeah. I struggled this journey. In fact, the only person who really held my hand was my dad. My dad refused mm. to give up. He said, there's no way. Mm. He refused completely. Mm -hmm. And so alcoholism, especially amongst women, that's why I came out fighting for women. Yeah. Because there are so many women who are struggling with alcoholism. Yeah. But it is still the elephant in the room in Africa. Yeah. Alcoholism and women and the word prostitution fit in the same sentence. I was neither a prostitute. Mm -hmm. I was just, I just became an alcoholic. Yeah. You see, mine mm -hmm. is not genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. That means, you know, there are, there are places where alcoholism runs in the family. Yes, yes. It doesn't run in ours. Mm -hmm. Me, I was just, I just found myself in that place. It was the environment. It was the environment and the circumstances and my childhood traumas and all those things. So I was trying to cover them up by using something that ended up depressing me and making me sink even further. Mm -hmm. And there are so many women who are struggling with this thing, mm -hmm. but it's still the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. There's still that stigmatization. And so that is why even part of my initiative is to teach people that alcoholism is no respect of gender. You know, it cuts across men and women. It's only that it affects us more mm. because of the way God wired us, our reproductive system and all that, you yeah. see? Mm. Due to my alcoholism, I've had two miscarriages back to back. Um, my daughter, who is seven now, is, is here by the masses of God, you see. That is also what alcoholism does to women, you know. So I always tell people, pick a struggle, mm -hmm. either raise a family or drink. Mm -hmm. You can't have it both ways, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. There are many who are suffering from that, but they don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I came out to speak very strongly about this and say that an alcoholic woman can be helped. And she does exist. She could be your mother, your sister, your daughter, your friend. But if people keep... But burying their heads in the sand mm -hmm. it doesn't help anybody mm -hmm. people need to have this conversation but people are still afraid so me i came out and said you may throw stones but you throw stones me i'll build houses with them yeah because wow. i'm helping your daughter your sister your mother mm. your friend. yeah yeah i think it's high time we actually normalize this conversation yeah. because we tend to think that uh, because we assume that it's a choice that people make to be alcoholics yeah. so we tend to just be very careless with our words, mm. you know, alijipatapo, mm. alijitakia, yani malaya, yeah. it comes better in Swahili. So, <laughs> but we need a lot of compassion, we need, a lot, we need empathy, yeah. we need a lot of information so we can just stop being careless. Because yeah. when you deal with alcoholics or addicts in general, wanatakanga a lot of love, mm. a lot of affirmation. Mm. And it's, you know, it's, they just need to be understood. We are not validating their behavior, yeah. we are not saying that whatever at the them numbing their pain, that is the right way to numb their mm. pain. We're just giving them the love and affirmation that they need because deep down, those are innate needs of human beings. Yeah. JP, Nikulete <laughs> Kwamkutano, you've heard her story. I still have questions for her, but Nataka too to interact. Um, yeah, Mesema, her alcoholism is not a genetic uh, predisposition. predisposition. It was a, uh, an issue of the environment, nature versus nurture, yeah? Mm. So we can just take it up from there and what, what other causes do you have for alcoholism? Mm. Thank you, Jackie. Mm. Uh, first, I want to affirm Carol for coming out and speaking out yeah. about alcoholism. Mm. Because many people are suffering, are struggling in silence. Yeah. They don't want to come out and they are struggling. Um, when we look at alcoholi alcoholism, first we need to understand that these um, are chronic, it's a disease a chronic uh, relapsing disease oh, okay. and it's characterized by a lot of denial mm -hmm. and inability mm -hmm. to make a, a choice mm -hmm. even though you know the consequences mm -hmm. but you cannot just make a decision mm -hmm. so um many people get into it knowing what is going on mm -hmm. But um, they, do, they cannot, they, are, they live in denial. Mm. Uh, that's why when you are told that you, are, you drink a lot, mm. you say no. Mm. But now coming back to your question, mm -hmm. the predisposition. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's that genetic. Mm. Um, but there are other things that can make someone get into it. From her story, mm -hmm. I picked an uh, aspect of pressure, mm -hmm. peer pressure, mm -hmm. from her, um, a friend mm -hmm. uh, who was telling her that if you do this, I'll, uh, of course, there's a reward at the end. Mm. So pressure, many of us, if you look at young people or 
majority of those who are in alcoholism, mm. they are driven by their friends, their um, people who are very close to them. Mm -hmm. So peer pressure, mm -hmm. um, search for identity. Mm. You want to know, maybe you want to fit in a certain group. Yeah. All my friends drink. Mm. For me to fit in that group, mm -hmm. then I have to be with them. I also have to drink. Mm. Uh, um, it could also be characterized by that point where uh, lack of self-awareness. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't know wh who you are. Mm. You just want to fit. Uh, mm. those, those are some of the things that can fuel things that can make people mm -hmm. get into alcoholism. Mm -hmm. We can name, ma there, are, there are many, but yeah. let me just name a few. Mm. You know, they say every behavior is need-driven. Uh, mm. Looking at her story, mm. first of all, you grew up in a perfectionist home, like your mom was a perfectionist. Mm. I, I pick that your dad was the lenient one, mm. who was the good cop. Mm. Um, your mom was um, the bad cop. So somehow... <laughs> Uh, you felt the need to be perfect in her eyes because, I mean, I think she was always on your case. And so that pressure also made you want to just, you know, get out of the shell and get an identity of your own. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny you should say that because mm. that, that has followed me, I think, until today. Oh. I mean, I'm in my early 40s now, but I still feel the need to toe the line with her. Even now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that... There's that... I should, I should, is it like a covering or what? There's always that need to, to toe the line with mm. her. Mm. I've never really been able to break away from that. Mm. Probably I need to, be, to see a therapist for that. But I've never really been able to break away from that. And so I've tried to break that cycle with my kids. Mm -hmm. I allow my kids to be, you mm. know, mm. as much as I can. Yeah. Because it's, it's a terrible way to grow up when you still feel like you are living, yeah, actually you're living in the shadow of mm. someone. Mm. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And I think that is, like he has said, mm. the lack of self-awareness of who is Caro, who truly is Caro, yeah. you know. And that was very hard for me to, to, to understand for years. Mm -hmm. Who am I? What am I? Why am I here? And um, after every episode of alcohol, I would always ask myself, what the hell am I done? For real? Yeah, 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 yeah. And any alcoholic who, who is honest will tell you. They always ask themselves, what the hell have I done? Mm. I have people who live in our neighborhood who are now in their 50s and they are stuck in alcoholism. Mm. And the reason they can't get out is because what will happen after I get out of this? I'm in my 50s now. Where do I start? Mm. So alcoholism is a, it's a very bad bubble mm. to be stuck in, especially mm -hmm. when you don't have support mm -hmm. and you don't know where you're going after that. It's a terrible, it's a nightmare. I think I wouldn't wish alcoholism on even my worst enemy if I had any. It's a terrible place to be. Mm. Terrible, terrible. Especially for a woman. It's pathetic. Especially for but, a woman? Yeah, because we are the child bearers. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. We are the ones raising kids. Mm. Whether you're married or you're not married. Mm. As long as you have kids. Those kids are looking to you. Mm -hmm. What becomes of them? Mm. It becomes a ripple effect. It mm -hmm. could catch up with them. Yeah. And if it doesn't catch up with them, they'll, be, they'll grow up to be adult children of alcoholics. Mm -hmm they'll be stigmatized for the rest of their life, you see? So someone somewhere has to break the cycle. Mm. And that is what I'm trying to do. And that is why I even wrote my first book. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't have a hard copy here. But if anyone wanted it as an e-book, they can get it. That's why I wrote, just to, to bring to light mm. what happens in the life of a woman who's going... You read it? Yes, I have. She, what, the, what happens in the life of a woman mm. who has been through alcoholism? It's a terrible place, I'm telling you. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But there's always a way out. Yeah. There are people who relapse and relapse and re they keep lapsing over and over and over. I have a client who's been to rehab nine times. But for her, it reached a place. It's her mindset that changed. Yeah. It's not about going to rehab. You yourself, you have to reach a place where you're tired of being tired, of being tired. And you decide, I'll do this thing. I'll kick this thing one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And it helps. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jackie, I'm yeah. listening what she's saying mm -hmm. that parenting is also key yeah. and just relating to her story mm. and uh, picking the aspect of low esteem mm. where did it came from mm. uh, once you are able to identify that it was as a result of mm -hmm. my background yeah. the parenting mm -hmm. background mm -hmm. then 
that's uh, the best place where you can begin mm. healing. She's, she has mentioned that people are taken to rehabs and they can go nine, ten times. But they still come back to yeah. go yeah. back to alcoholism. Yeah. Uh, why? Because maybe they are not ready. They, they, do, they are not aware that they, uh, they have that power to change. So they'll go to rehab because they want to please Jackie. Mm. They want to please Caro. Mm. Caro has forced her to, mm. to go back to, um, to, go to rehab. Mm -hmm. When they come back, mm -hmm. after a few months, few weeks, their life continues normal, uh, as before. Yeah. So um, it all needs to begin with you mm -hmm. as a person. Mm -hmm. Your mind, mm -hmm. the mindset. Mm -hmm. If today I say that I don't want to drink my tea or mm -hmm. my coffee using mm -hmm. this cup, mm -hmm. however much you tell me to drink, mm -hmm. I'll not use the cup. Mm -hmm. So it begins with my own mindset. And I may need to make a choice, need to decide that this is what I want. And I believe maybe, Carol, you can agree with me. It's you who made the decision. I made the decision. Mm. And then I real actually it's in this conversation that I've realized I think I never felt worthy. I never felt good enough. I never mm -hmm. felt, you know, um, I was at par, you know, the expectations. I never met them. And um, so I, I think subconsciously I rebelled yeah. against what was expected. But yeah. you see, I rebelled and it almost killed me. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> I thank God that I'm here. Mm -hmm. You see, so I, I went extreme. But um, it's very important to be self aware. Mm -hmm which many people are not. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you start being self-aware, it changes a lot of things. It even changes your relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first relationship that changes is your relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you also learn how to set boundaries mm -hmm. with family, mm -hmm. with friends. Yeah. Those people who are not important, please, mm -hmm. you don't need them. Mm -hmm. You must learn to be selfish with yourself. You love yourself so much mm. that you will not want to do this to yourself ever again like for me that's where i've reached i look at people who are still struggling with this thing and i feel sorry mm. because until you identify who you are and for me as a believer for those who you know you need to identify yourself in christ mm -hmm. that is how the journey begins mm. but if you're still here you're there you don't even know where you're going mm -hmm. my friend you will go around in circles you will relapse until the day you're called six feet under mm. but you have to get to a place where you say enough is enough. enough and that's where it starts mm -hmm. it all starts here your mindset this mm -hmm. is the most powerful tool that you have mm -hmm. use it to your advantage what Maybe. was your aha moment <sighs> my aha moment mm -hmm. is when i almost lost my children i almost lost my children because of my drinking i almost lost them completely i have had clients who've lost their children to the government because of their inability. And then you see me, I'm a single parent. So an alcoholic single parent. Why would the government take my children? I have a client who lost her daughter when her daughter was six. She got to stay with her daughter when her daughter was finishing from school. How do you make up for those years? So me, that made me toe the line. That made me toe the line. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. Before that, I, I was so bitter. But naturally, thank God, because I say, this was my wake-up call. Not even my health, my children. That was it. Mm. That was my wake-up call. Yeah. So to any lady out there who is struggling, I always tell them, imagine reach out, especially if you have children. Yeah. Reach out and seek help mm. while it is still day. Mm. Don't get to the place where me I got. Me, I'm alive by the mercies of God and maybe by, because of the prayers of all those who prayed for me. Mm. But not many are as lucky as I am. Mm. So... It is paramount that they seek help as early as possible. Yeah. You've just reminded me of a quote I read this morning, and I didn't know I would apply it here. We, we are constantly saying that we could die for our children. Mm. But could we actually live for our children, make the right decisions, make smart choices so mm -hmm. they can see us in mm -hmm. our authentic selves, yeah. not just you know, saying that we'll do anything, we will die for them. Yeah. We need to live. We need to live for them. Yes, and live fully. Because you see, mm -hmm. what you're doing now, mm -hmm. your children can see. Yes. They might not verbalize it, yeah. but they're internalizing. Mm -hmm. And it brings stigma to them later. They grow up wounded. They will have families. It is a vicious cycle that never stops. So you have to be, you know, when you're living a life that is not desirable, desirable for your children, mm. you are being so selfish to those children. By the way, 
You're being so selfish. You don't see what you're doing, but it will catch up with you sooner or later. And that's what many people don't realize, mm. you see? Mm. I could go on and on and on. This is a topic that is so close to my heart, but we will do this probably another time. Mm -hmm. When you have more time, Cindy. <laughs> when you have more time. JP, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, uh, just to ask her, what has kept her going after? What has kept me going mm. is my, first it's my love for Jesus, my love for myself, my love for my children, my love, my desire to see people healed and whole. Because it's possible. Me, I was a mess, proper mess. If my dad was to sit here right now, he'd give you stories with the shock. Mm. I was a mess. But there's, there's always a way to turn around. But it starts within me. Mm. Yeah? That is what has kept me going. I want to be able to live to see that I help somebody somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to receive their healing and become better people. Thank you. Um, maybe just to add on, um, for people who are struggling and they've made a decision, mm. they also need to have a very strong support system Absolutely. around them. Mm. Yeah. Because they are the people, uh, they are, the support system are the ones who can keep you going. Mm. Uh, without them again, the chances of you going back, mm -hmm. relapsing, mm -hmm. are high. Yeah. So you also need to have a very strong support system mm -hmm. around you. Yeah. And in her case, I also believe your dad has My played dad, a very big role. has played a very big role. Yeah. Mm. And um, I'm also, I also do a lot of service. It's also important to take up acts of service. Go mm. to a children's home, visit, volunteer somewhere. Oh. You know, when, when you give yourself mm. to others without expecting anything in return, it is very fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself, those vices, they start disappearing slowly mm. by slowly. Me at scene, it mm. works. But you keep into yourself, oh, me, I, oh, me, myself, and I, there's nowhere you're going. <laughs> give yourself out there to mm. humanity, even if it's your church. Go and ask if you can sweep the church, arrange chairs, just do something. An act of service. Mm. It also helps. It's very therapeutic mm. as well. Mm. For those who like animals, go to KSPCA, take care of those cats and dogs. Yeah. And Adopt one, if need be. Maybe. <laughs> they don't kill it. But, you know, it also mm. work. Uh, you have been through the rehabilitation process. You have been to rehab? Twice. Twice. So the first time? It was 2017. Mm -hmm. Next time was 2019, when COVID struck. Mm -hmm. um, everything in my life just went flat. Mm. No clients, no anything. I'd also been invited to speak um, in, 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 I'd been invited to speak in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in 2019. And then all of a sudden the CS decides lockdown. Oh. That mm -hmm. was the time. Yeah. So everything just came crumbling. Mm -hmm. But my mental lapse had started way before that. Okay. So when that announcement was made, me, I can't remember how I walked to the Wild Spirit mm -hmm. <laughs> and what a 750 ml. And my lapse was very quick because it was noticed very quickly also. So then I went back to rehab and I came out after three months. Mm -hmm. And I've been pushing forward mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm imagining there's someone who's watching you and they are recovering also. Mm -hmm. Or they want to get into rehab and they're wondering how to go about it. Mm -hmm. If you can explain how the recovery process was for you. Of course the experience could be slightly different. But how was yours so they can be able to identify with you? Um, first, uh, many people have this uh, perception that rehab is like going to jail. Mm. Rehabilitation, rehabs, may I call them treatment facilities, they are not jail. Um, me, I, I liked the process. Mm. Though the first two weeks, as much as I went voluntarily, I was in denial. Mm. But I got to adjust to the process. Rehab is a place where you go and find your healing. You know, it's a place where you get to learn yourself, mm. to love yourself. If you're honest with yourself, you get to deal with your underlying issues. issues. You see? Yeah. Number two, and this one I'm even going to do a YouTube video on this one. You need to do your due diligence to find out the good re rehabs in this country. Because 90% of them are yeah. business. Yes, sadly. 90% yeah. are business. Mm. Then they get counselors who went to counseling school for two months and they come out and say they are counselors. That's and they know right. nothing. True? Yeah. yeah true. Majority of these counselors know absolutely nothing. Do your homework. Find out this rehab, who runs it, what are the counselors like. How many people do you know who have gone through that rehab and are they standing to date? As much as you cannot say this person will stand because they went to a particular rehab, mm. however, the way that rehab is run mm. plays a big role yeah. in the recovery of the client. Mm. 
So um, for me, I enjoyed the process and I came out and I speak in rehabs quite a bit. Mm. And so rehab, going to rehab does not make you any less of a person. Me, mm -hmm. I've been to rehab toys and I'm seated here having this conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, I think going to rehab the second time made me stronger. Wow. Because the first time I was too confident. I came out with overconfidence. Because of, all of a sudden I started being shown on TV, radio and all that. But uh, my overconfidence now took me to rehab the second time. Mm. And after that, I said never again. But if you go to a good treatment facility, mm. you will learn how to deal with your underlying issues, yeah. how to deal with the struggles in your life, mm -hmm. how to deal with the people, the significant others in your life. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And me, I enjoyed it. In fact, I think the first time I went to rehab, mm -hmm. when I came out, I cried. I was like, oh my God, I found such a nice space. Mm -hmm. So it's important. And anyone who wants to know about rehab, they can talk to me. Mm -hmm. I'll give them more information. Mm -hmm. Like credible rehabs? Credible rehabs. Yeah. Yes, and I will put my name on the line. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know it's a challenge we face. Like mm -hmm. you get so many people who are not fully qualified. Yeah. Because to be an addiction counselor, you have to, to have gone through the school and yes. learned. Yes. You, you, I cannot call myself an addiction addiction counselor yeah. because I'm not. I'm yeah. not qualified for yeah. it. Yeah. So we need to practice our due diligence so that we can know the qualified people to help addicts yeah. mm. in this, you know, in this transition. That's mm, very that's true. true. Mm. Yeah, if we have counselors here out here. Mm -hmm. Yes, someone will call himself a counselor, yeah. but they are not qualified. It's true. I know. Uh, yeah. I'm a counselor, yes. but I cannot say that I'm an addiction counselor. Yeah. If, in fact, if, when it comes to matters of addiction. I can consult her mm -hmm. uh, because mm. I'm not an addiction counselor. Yes. Uh, so it's very, very important we know, even those people whom we are referring to, mm -hmm. the rehabs, mm -hmm. the counselors who are there, mm. are they qualified? Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, many people don't, don't bother. You know, by the time you're taking someone to rehab, mm. you're desperate. Yeah, I know. So you just look around, you see, see whichever rehab is next door, you throw the person there. Yeah. You don't even know who the director is. Yeah. You just want this person to be in a place where you know they are locked up. Mm. They are not going to have their drug of choice. Mm. But you don't even know anything about the place. Then the person comes out. Mm. They lapse immediately. They leave the gate mm. and you say rehab doesn't work. Mm. That's very wrong. You need to find out. Mm -hmm. Go do your homework. Before you take that person there, mm -hmm. know where you're taking the person. Mm. How that place is run. Mm. Otherwise, you're just wasting your thousands. And rehab is not cheap. Mm. It is, it is but you need to know where you're taking your person. Yeah. Yeah. You've spoken about relapse. You've relapsed twice yeah. and you've also mingled with people who have had uh, relapses severely. What causes relapse? I think this one you can... What causes relapse? There are so many reasons. Mm. First is, we call it the PPT, the people, the places and the things. Mm. People could be the people you are hanging out with before you went to rehab are still the same people you meet when you leave the rehab. You refuse to change your circle of friends. Oh. People could also be your family. You come from a very toxic family. Mm. Or they, they lack sub, they they lack they they don't give you support. Mm. You used to steal from them when you are in active addiction. Mm. Now they have you've come out. Mm. They are still locking doors and saying, "Hey, you, we don't believe you." Uh -huh. You know they are still looking at you. Those ones of na alama ya mshangao utaibatu So they are not supportive of you. Mm. The places you used to go, mm. you still go. The mm. things you used to do, even some of the movies you used to watch, you still watch those things. So mm -hmm. they draw you back to that. I'll give a case in point. Last year. Uh, was it last year? Yeah. We buried my, my son's dad. Mm -hmm. He died of alcoholism. Um, he just collapsed and died. And he'd been to rehab for six months. So he left and um, instead of trying to live a sober life, he still went back to the same people, places and things. So it killed him. And for, I think for their family, it was a wake-up call mm. that you need to be mm. strategic when you're dealing with somebody in addiction. If it is possible, move from where you used to live, if it is possible. Wow. If it is not, mm. may God help you to have a very strong will mm. to fight this thing and say no. Mm. Otherwise, you will live in active use for the rest of your life. Mm. I have seen it over and over and over mm. again. Mm. Yeah. JP? Um, just to add on uh, what she has mentioned, also some past experiences, triggers yeah. that can remind you of your past experiences, yeah. the unfinished business. Yeah. Uh, if you, you were brought, uh, brought up by a very strict parent mm. and that was, that's the thing that made you lose your, your esteem mm. and then you get from the, re the rehab, you go back to the same place, mm. then you can relapse. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's just to, to add from what she has mentioned. Yeah. Uh, all right, now in the interest of time, um, it's been very good having you, Jerry. Thank I you. like calling you Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Also. <laughs> JP also. It's a pleasure having you here. Mm.
Could you give us a parting shot? A parting shot. Um, still I rise. Amazing. Still mm -hmm. I rise. For the person who is suffering with any sort of addiction, mm -hmm. not necessarily alcoholism, mm -hmm. any sort of addiction, there's always a way out. Yeah. As long as you're on this earth mm -hmm. and your brain is functioning, mm -hmm. there's always a way out. Mm -hmm. Don't stay in that cocoon, don't stay in that bubble yeah. thinking things will fall into place. You have to make things align themselves. It is you, your willpower, your mindset. Mm -hmm. You must love yourself so strongly and so deeply and so passionately and so selfishly and say, I can't do this thing anymore. If you want a better life for yourself. Mm -hmm. May I choose a better life for myself. Mm -hmm. And so me, I'm here. I can mentor. I do teach. Mm -hmm. I do speak. Mm -hmm. And I'm a living example that God changes people. So me, if I was, if God has changed me, I don't see why He can't change anybody else. Yeah, yeah. yeah you've had there is people. always hope, guys. There yeah. is always hope. There is hope. Mm -hmm. There is healing. Yeah. And healing is the new call. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for watching. Bye bye.